Amen. All right. So in Genesis, or I'm excuse me, Exodus chapter 19, we have a real interesting story here. Um, this is right after the children of Israel are led out of the land of Egypt. Right? And God sends all those miracles and they're wandering in the wilderness. And it says in verse number one, in the third month when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. So we're three months after they've been led out. And now they're wandering through the wilderness. And basically what's happening is that God's dealing with Moses, right? Of course, as he has been. Moses is, is his mouthpiece. Moses is the one in communication with God. And He's telling Moses, okay, I'm going to come down on the mountain and I want you to get everybody ready and, and tell them, you know, they need to be sanctified, they need to be pure, they need to be ready. I'm going to come down and speak with you. And he says, I'm going to speak so that, look at verse number, um, Uh, where is it? He's going to speak to them. He says that they'll believe you forever. So it's like they're going to hear God speak unto Moses. Verse number nine. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud that the, the people may hear when I speak with thee and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. So God wants the people to know He's dealing and speaking with Moses directly so that they can hear God speaking to Moses. So when Moses comes down and tells them, they know, hey, Moses is telling us the truth, right? He's a man of God. But um, what's, that's not really what I want to focus on today. What I want to focus on is first God tells Moses, okay, like verse number 10, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that ye go not up into the mount, or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. So he's saying, set up a boundary. Set up these bounds, he says, so that they know, okay, you can't go past this. You can't go up unto the mount because God's going to come down. And you need to be ready for this, but if anybody tries to come up, if anyone wants to go get a look at God, he's saying, you're going to be put to death, right? This is a very serious command, wouldn't you agree? I mean, this is something that they need to hear. You don't want anybody missing out on this message and accidentally going up to, oh man, look at all that fire up there. What's going on up there? I'm going to go check it out. No, this is something that's serious. You want to make sure everybody hears this. Everyone's aware of this. Look, God's coming down in three days. In three days, you can't cross this line and go up to God because he said that anybody that does is going to be put to death. Very important message. He says in verse 13, There shall not in hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through, whether it be beast or man. Said, Animals, men, I don't care. You come up to that mountain, you're going to be put to death. He says, It shall not live when the trumpet soundeth long. Um, they shall come up to the mount. So, three days later, God comes down and he calls Moses up unto him. Right? So, here he is. Verse number 16. Let's look at this again. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And this is what happens all throughout the Bible. When people are in the presence of God, they fear. They get scared because God is so powerful. I mean, there's thunders and lightnings and earthquakes. You know, I mean, all this stuff is going on and they hear this trumpet sound coming from heaven. It's an amazing sight. It's a terrible sight. It's something that instills terror in us. And we don't really fully understand that because we haven't been in the presence of God like these people have, like a few people have throughout history. And every single time, the reaction is the same. I mean, they drop down on their knees, they get scared, and they have a real fear of God in their hearts, which is very healthy as we ought to. But so here we are. God comes down. Verse number 17, And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mountain. Nether just means the lower. They're at the, the, the base of the mountain. You know, they're not coming up to the mountain. He brings them out and says, okay, you know, God's here. Let's go meet with them. Verse 18, and Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as, as the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mount quaked greatly. So 
you got this mountain that's just quite, it's, it's, there's an earthquake, this mountain shaking, there's this fire coming up out of the top and the smoke's just going up like a big furnace because God has come down. Amazing. I mean, it's, it's hard to even put yourself into that situation. An incredible sight, right? I mean, the power of God. God has come down to this mountain and it says in verse 19, And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake and God answered him by a voice. So Moses calls out to God, God responds, right? Verse number 20, And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai and, and on, the, on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. So he says, you know, Moses, come up here. Moses goes up. Verse number 21, And the Lord said unto Moses, I love this, and this, this stuck with me when I was doing my Bible reading or my Bible listening. Moses, I mean, all this stuff is going on. You know, God already prepared him. And he says, in three days, I'm going to come down. You're going to speak with me. All this stuff's going to happen. So he goes up. And I don't know how many of you have ever hiked up mountains before. I don't know exactly how big um, Mount Sinai is. But I'm sure it's not small. I mean, hiking up to the top of a mountain takes, you know, takes a little bit of time and some effort to go up to the top of a mountain. Moses goes up to the top of a mountain. Verse 21 says, and the Lord said unto Moses, go down. <laughs> So he gets all the way up to the top just for God to say, okay, Moses, go back down, right? But you got to do what God says, right? I mean, we don't know, but, but why does he say go down? And this is really interesting. Look at this. He says, charge the people lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze and many of them perish. And let the priests also which come near to the Lord sanctify themselves lest the Lord break forth upon them. And Moses said unto the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai. For thou chargest us. He said, you already told us, saying, set bounds upon them about the mount and sanctify. He's saying, look, God, you know, I don't need to go down there. I already told them. You already told us if they come through, they're going to be put to death. You know, why do I have to go down there again? Look at verse 24. And the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up, thou and Aaron with thee. But let not the priests and the people break through to come up unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. And what I take away from this passage, and this is, you know, oftentimes we need to hear things over and over again for our own good. And God knew this about the people. God knew, hey, he already told them in advance, he didn't set up a boundary, make sure they know if you come up to this mount, you're going to be put to death. And, and that's what Moses says. Hey, you already told us that. See, Moses was a type of guy that you had to tell him one time and he would do it. But not everybody's like that. I mean, Moses was a great man of God. He obeyed God. He was obedient. He was a very humble man, a meek man, and he listened to what God had to say, which is one of the reasons why God chose him. I mean, he was, he, he was the perfect instrument to be used of God. But not everybody's like that. Most of us aren't. Most of us need to be told things over and over again. We need to hear it again, and it's for our own good. And think about that. I mean, this is the death penalty. This is life and death. He, he wants to make sure, look, make sure these people know you can't come up here. You will be put to death. And he sent them all the way back down the mountain just to give them that message again. Because God thought it was important enough after he'd already come up. And, and why was that? Well, it's one thing to hear things, right, in advance. They heard it in advance. They said, okay, yeah, yeah, we can't go. We're going to be quit to death. We understand that. And, and they're probably, you know, heartedly saying, yeah, we won't do that. But now they're actually in the situation. Now God has actually come down. You see this quaking mountain. You see these fires. And is it terrifying? Yes. But is it really interesting? Yeah, yeah of course it is. And he's worried that people are going to, you know, their curiosity is going to get the better of them. And they're going to want to find out what's going on. What does God really look God's right there. Man, what does he look like? I want to go up and check this out. Moses is going up there. Why can't I go up there? And this is the way people are going to be thinking. But God's saying, no. Remind them. Let them know again. Now that they can see all this stuff happening, remind them again and let them know you cannot come up here. You'll be put to death. And this is the way sin could look in our life as well. Okay, we can hear things from the Bible. You can hear things, especially kids. They could hear stuff about alcohol and be like, don't ever touch alcohol. It's a sin. It's wickedness. And, and, and they'll be like, oh yeah, okay, well I won't do that. You know, It's going to be a bad punishment from God. He's not going to be happy with me. But then they start getting older and then they find themselves in a situation and maybe they're around some people and they're getting drunk and everything looks so fun and they're starting to get curious. Oh man, everyone's talking about this fun that they're having at these parties and how great it was and how drunk they were and how everything was just so much fun. And their curiosity starts to get the better of them and they're starting to think well maybe I should try that too I mean they're all having a great time it doesn't seem as bad as it was preached to me from God's word 
And if they don't hear the message periodically, if it's not refreshed, if it's not gone over and repeated unto them, it's a lot easier to, to get involved in that. Because what happens is your memory starts to fade. All those scriptures that talk about, like in Proverbs, it says, um, your eyes shall behold strange women and your heart shall utter perverse things. And, and, and all the, the, the negative, the reasons why you need to avoid alcohol, the more you start hearing and seeing these other things going on, you're gonna, you kind of forget about those things. Why was it that important? And what we don't ever want to happen is just rely on a rule where it's just, you're not allowed to drink because you're not allowed to drink because that's the rules. You need to understand where those come from and it needs to be, oftentimes with the human beings, with us, it needs to be pounded into our heads. We need to hear these things over and over and over again. Because the, the, the more time that goes by, that memory is going to fade. And think about this. I mean, in this case, this is death. There's no making a mistake. With alcohol, you, 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 you may not die as a result of that sin. That wasn't the punishment according to God for that sin. But this was. I mean, this, you don't get a second chance. When you break God's rules on this, you're going to be put to death, and that's it. If anyone would have broken forth onto that mountain, they would have been put to death, and God would have made sure of that because that was the punishment for that sin. Think about this in, with um, Nadab and Abihu. They were the children of Aaron. Flip, if you would, over Leviticus chapter 10. We're in Exodus. Just flip over Leviticus chapter number 10. It's not that far. It's a little bit to your right. Leviticus chapter number 10. Because... God had made these commandments, and, and if you remember when they created the tabernacle, and there's the, the way that they were supposed to do everything, all the way from what they were supposed to wear, their garments, how they offered the sacrifices, everything was laid out very specifically. God had those, the, the, everything ordered and said, this is the way you're going to do it. Now, with Nadab and Abihu, they were the sons of Aaron. Aaron was the high priest, and they were sons, and they had specific special roles to play in, in the um, ceremony or in the, in the carrying out of their service for God, the way that they served God. And one of the things that they needed to do was to present their, their fire before the Lord, which is an incense. There was a special incense, and God told him exactly how to make it. He says, this, these are the ingredients. This is how you do it. This is how I want it done. You're not going to use this for yourselves because this is set apart. It's holy just for me. And what do they do? Nadab and Abihu, look at verse 1 of chapter 10 of Leviticus. It says, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them. And they died before the Lord. And Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Moses knew. Moses was the type of guy, he didn't need to be told twice. He already, this happened and he's like, Ugh, why didn't they just listen the first time? You know, they didn't have to die. It's a sad thing. You know, Aaron's sons died in the service of the Lord because they disobeyed, because they sinned, because they thought better. They, for whatever reason, and we don't necessarily know the reason why they did it, but God said, this is going to be the way it is, and if you don't do it this way, you're going to die. And you think of Uzzah, um, when, when King David was bringing the Ark of the Covenant back into Israel, you know, it was the, the Philistines had taken away when they lost in battle, when, when Saul was killed, they took the Ark and they brought it into their land, and they were being cursed and stuff, so they wanted to get rid of it. They are bringing it back, and, but when they brought it back, instead of carrying it the way that God said on their shoulders with the staves, and they were supposed to carry it back in, they put it on a cart. Well, why, why would we have people actually carrying this thing? We've got a much better idea. Let's put it on a cart, because that's what the Philistines did. They had it on a cart. Oh, this is like, we'll just have some animals, pull it, it'll be all good, everything's fine. Until the animal trips or some lizard, you know, gets excited and starts running, and now all of a sudden the ark's going to fall off the cart. And this man think he's doing a good thing. He said, oh, I'm going to reach out. I'm going I'm to make sure that doesn't fall. I mean, this is sacred. We don't want this to fall off and go on the ground. Cost him his life. He was not allowed to do that. And God was serious about that. And see, there's so many things in the Bible where God is dead serious about. 
literally dead serious about. And we have a tendency to just say, not that big of a deal. Who cares if, I mean, come on, is God really going to kill me? I mean, I'm just trying to help. I'm just holding it up. And I mean, Nate having it by you. We're just serving the Lord. We're just trying to help out. I mean, we're, we're offering fire unto God. It's for the Lord. It's not for some other God. It's not for anyone else. It's for God. But God says, no, just obey me. Listen to what I have to say. And it's going to cost you your life if you don't. Those types of things we need to hear all the more often. All the more. People are going to hear you preach. People hear people, pastors like me and others, you know, preach hard against sin. And preach real hard against sin. And we'll name all the sins and try to go through as many as possible, all of them uh, for that matter. And, and you know, oftentimes they'll claim, oh, that's hate speech. Or they'll say, well, why are you focusing so much on the negative and focusing on the law and things like that? Because it's important because God has consequences for our sin. Focusing on the law is what's going to save lives. It's going to save you from ruining your life by getting involved in some sin that you're just curious about and you just want to check it out. And yeah, I think I read somewhere or heard somewhere that that's not what we're supposed to be doing, but everyone else seems to be doing it and they're doing just fine and they're having fun with it, so I want to try it out too. And when you don't hear about these things thundered from the pulpit, then you're a lot more likely to go out and do them. And I don't care if people think it's hate speech or, oh, it's negative, oh, it's put people in bad mood. Look, I would much rather have people be in a bad mood when they leave here than go out and commit an adultery that God said is punishable by death. I would much rather have that. If it would save people from going off and getting involved into this wickedness and this sin. God lists off in Leviticus chapter number 20. We might as well just turn there real briefly. I'm not going to read a whole lot out of here. I already had an entire sermon dedicated to the death penalty. And the reason why I preach an entire sermon dedicated to that is so that we know these sins are all worthy of death. And I'm not afraid to, to re-preach some of that today because we need to hear it again. We need to understand, especially the more that this world is okay with things like adultery. Oh, it's fine. Just get a divorce. I mean, these days, marriage, it's like boyfriend and girlfriend. It's not husband and wife anymore. It's just like, oh, don't like your spouse? Just get a divorce and go find another one. That's what people do when they're dating. When you don't like, ah, oh, yeah, we, we don't get along that well. Yeah, I'm just going to dump her. I'm going to find somebody else. That's dating. That's not marriage. But people these days are treating marriage as if it's just a boyfriend and girlfriend, as opposed to a vow where you're spending the rest of your life with somebody and say, no matter what happens, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will be your husband or I will be your wife all the way until the day you or I die. That's what marriage is all about. But we live in a culture, we live in a society that has been influenced by Satan, the God of this world, who is trying to make you think it's not a big deal. And the more people are out there committing adultery, the more whoremongers that are out there, the more it's getting pumped into our heads, the more you're going to think it's really not that big of a deal. It's not that bad. Homosexuality, look, I mean, look, we're in Leviticus 20, right? Look at this. We're not going to read through the whole thing. We're just going to read through a few of these. Look at verse number 10. It says, And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. They both are worthy of, that, that's worthy of death. Penalty. This is how God views the sin of adultery. He says, you deserve to die. You don't get a second chance. You don't get to say, I'm sorry. It's the heat of the moment or my wife wasn't paying that much attention to me and I had to go find some comfort from someone else. He says, no, you deserve to die. We need to hear these things more than once. You hear it once, you forget about it, and the world's going to corrupt your mind into thinking it's really not that bad. Let's look at a few more. We'll keep reading because in the same context, there's, just, there's, there's a few more sins. Verse number 11, it says, And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Something you don't hear very much about today. Now, it may not be um, um, something that's commonplace yet. I guarantee you we're going there, though. I guarantee you there's people that have no clue that to do such a thing is worthy of the death penalty. They think, oh, what's the big deal? You know, so it's, that, that was my father's wife, but I love her. I want to marry her. That's what, I mean, 
people probably think that. They think, oh, it's not a big deal. No, that's wickedness. That's sin. The Bible, God thinks that that deserves a death penalty. Verse number 12, And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Their blood shall be upon him. Again, and, and these things probably happen in our society today. I don't know. I mean, I don't hear about them necessarily, but they're probably happening. I'm sure in some trailer park somewhere you've got some men that, that, are, that are stealing their son's wives away from them or something. Who knows? That deserves a death penalty. Verse number 13, If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Again, we're living in a society today that wants to say, oh, it's just an alternative lifestyle. That's just what they do. You know, you do what you do, you know, but, but don't judge them. They do what they do and just leave them alone. It's no big deal. Hey, everybody's doing it. I mean, look at Hollywood. And I see these things on the internet sometimes. These articles say, oh, you would never guess all of these stars who are, you know, queers, who are homos. You would never guess. Oh, read this to find out who's really, you know, a homo. And it's like, they're starting to say there's just so many of them. And I don't doubt that anymore with the way that Hollywood is and with those freaks and those perverts and the movies that they're putting out. It probably is full of them. That's why we're getting so much filth in the entertainment industry. God puts a death penalty on that. We so much the more need to hear that in a culture where you're trying to be crammed down your throat to accept that. No! We will not accept that. I'm not going to give up any space to that. I'm going to stick with the Bible. God says it's a death penalty. It's serious. It's not just some slap on the wrist. This is, this is losing one's life forever. I mean, you dead. No second chance. Very serious sins. And I'm not going to keep going on and on. But if God feels so strongly about something that he's willing to say, no second chance, you lose your life, how should we feel about it? And this is coming from a God who is long-suffering and he is merciful and he extends so much mercy and, can, and, and, and loves us so much. The same God is, is ordaining a death sentence on these and many other sins that I didn't get to. How should we have a view on those things? See, the memory of things you hear has a tendency to fade when it's not reinforced, when it's not coming up again and again. You hear something once, you can receive it and, and agree with it and say, yeah, that's the truth. But over time, you have a tendency to forget about it, downplay it, and, and it kind of, you just don't really think about it much anymore. So maybe when a situation comes up where you would actually be confronted with uh, a decision to make where it would rely on that teaching, if you haven't really heard about it for a really long time, you're going to be real fuzzy about it. And, and you're a lot more likely to make the wrong choice out of your sin and out of your curiosity and out of whatever it else that's driving you into that because, yeah, I heard this one thing, but I'm kind of unsure about it now. I don't really know that much about it. I don't remember. I kind of remember hearing something like I shouldn't do that, but I don't really remember why. And it's easier to make justifications in your mind for those sins when you're not grounded. We're not that solid on the issues. And over time, it's easy to forget any of this stuff. We need the repetition of God's word to set us straight. Satan's agenda is being hammered into us from the world. Um, here's, a, here's a good example of this. When I go out soul winning, it's, you know, almost everybody, th you know, everyone agrees that we're all sinners. And the most common thing to use and the easiest thing to use is, is that of telling a lie. And oftentimes when we say, you know, Bible says for all of sin come short of the glory of God, you know, you're so you've done wrong, right? Yeah. And we ask people, have you told a lie? Yeah, yeah, I've told lies, you know. And, and you say, well, we, we've all told lies. And the common way of thinking is just kind of like, because we've all done it, it's okay. It's not that bad, at least. Not, not necessarily it's okay, but be, hey, if we've all just done this one sin, then it, then it can't be that bad, right? We've all done it. Well, from man's perspective, sure. But that's not God's perspective. That's not the way God looks at things. And um, it is a big deal when we, when we break God's commandments. And there's another great example of 
if you're not hearing, if you're not seeing the verses, if you're not seeing where God says, you know, thou shalt not bear false witness and how God hates lying. And actually, I'll just um, well, look at that real quick. In Proverbs chapter 6, go ahead and turn there if you would. Proverbs chapter 6, we're going to see a little bit of repetition in the Bible again, because this is the, remember the whole the whole subject of the sermon tonight is repetition. We need to hear these things over and over again, and why that's such a good thing for us to be reminded of this stuff from time to time. Proverbs chapter six, verse number sixteen. You know, when this is getting preached, you're going to be less likely to tell lies. Proverbs six sixteen says, "These six things doth the Lord hate; yea, seven are an abomination unto Him." Abomination is a very strong word, meaning God really hates that; it's abominable to Him. Verse number seventeen: a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, uh, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief. A false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. What did you notice about those seven things? One of them is mentioned twice. Lying. And what's it in context with? A proud look? Someone shedding innocent blood? Someone killing the innocent? Is an abomination to God? Yeah, so is lying. And lying is an abomination so much in God's eyes, he lists it twice. He repeats himself. He says, a lying tongue, and then he says later, a false witness that speaketh lies. God hates that. It's an abomination unto him. But, in a society, we can start thinking, well, everybody tells a lie. It's not that bad, right? Uh, no, actually it is. Actually, that's very bad. It's an abomination unto God. He hates it. He hates it when people lie. And that's why we look at verses like Revelation 21.8 that says, And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Because God views that as important. But the more we're engulfed in this world and, and, and looking upon all this wickedness and sin that we have, we might tend to downplay it. We need to keep hearing these things over and over and over again. This is one of the jobs of the, of the preachers, one of, one of the reasons why we come to church is to hear these things, to help us to stay straight, to help just remind us, refresh our memories and say, yes, yo, no, I, I can't be doing this. I can't be telling lies. I can't be, you know, um, thinking about another woman because if I were to commit adultery, I mean, God would be so upset with me that I deserve to die. Don't let the little justification start working in your mind. Repetition is very important in learning. Um, I have three young children, and we're homeschooling them, and we're trying to teach them things. You know, we're teaching them phonics and grammar, and you know, um, even as they learn to talk, they learn their ABCs. How is it that they learn their ABCs? Well, it's repetition. They learn them over and over and over again. We've got to keep on going over this stuff with them. They need to hear it more than just one time. They can't hear a concept or, or just see it one time, and just all of a sudden, boom, I know that. I mean, they'd be the smartest people in the world if they could just, we could just tell them one thing one time and they just got it and it's, okay, let's move on to the next thing. No. And that's how all of us are. We, 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 we need things to, to, to really be known, not just heard. We need to know it for ourselves by, by studying and working and, and going through things more than just once. And think about when kids learn how to talk. They often learn the real simple words and things they hear repetitively over and over again. That's why I know at least with one of our kids, their first word is like, no. Right? I mean, little kids hear that word all the time. It's real easy. It's one syllable. No. No. So they say, no. <laughs> or they'll learn, you know, mama, dad, dad, you know, something that, that, that you're working with them over and over again. You want them to, to, you know, they want you enough and they realize after so much repetition, oh, this is mama. I need to call for mama. Right? Um, whatever it is. I mean, there's, those, this is an example. We, we need to hear things over and over again as part of our learning process. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy 6. And Deuteronomy itself, as far as repetitions go in the Bible, Deuteronomy itself is a repetition in a way. The word Deuteronomy, and I don't know um, the exact meaning, but it basically it's like it's the second law. It's like the second giving of the law. And you notice in Deuteronomy, there's not really anything new 
in there. It's repeated law that has already been given in, in uh, Exodus and Leviticus. We see, we see the Levitical law. Well, Deuteronomy is a lot of the same things essentially restated. Okay, And that's what the word Deuteronomy is even meaning, is we're seeing a lot of repetition here. God is getting, driving these points home with us through the entire book of Deuteronomy. Look at chapter 6. We're in um, verse number 6. It says, And these words which I commanded thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. And it shall be, when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Very, very strong warning saying, look, you need to teach your children all the time. It needs to be pounded into their heads. This is God's word. This is God's law. We're studying it. We're talking about it every single day. When we wake up, when we go to bed, when we're walking in the street, when we're driving in the car, we're always talking about the law of the Lord because it's that important. Because when things are going well, when I've got, when I'm blessing you because you're listening and obeying me and you get all this stuff that you didn't even have to work for and I totally bless you, I don't want you to forget about me. Do not forget the Lord your God. Don't forget that he freed you from the, from the uh, land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. And even after you get saved, don't forget God's the one that freed you from that destination of hell, from that destruction. Keep your mind on the things of the Lord and study them all the time. We need this repetition. Even science will tell you that, that people need to hear things multiple times before they act on it. I think about marketing. I've been, I've been trying to get in different things for, um, for the church just to get the name out there so people know we exist so that they could come if they're looking for an independent fundamental Baptist church that does soul winning, is King James only, and all these things. If that's what, what they're, you know, they're minded, if they're like-minded believer, that they could at least know we're here so that they could come and join us. And I've been trying to do this, but just in marketing in general, you know, there's a few different theories on how it all works. And I'm not saying it's 100% exact, but there is an overall agreement that people, and it makes sense, that people need to see and to hear about things a few times before they'll actually act on it. And this is, there's been many studies about this and stuff, but it's basically, you know, you hear about something one time and, and you recognize it, but you say, okay, you kind of don't really think about it much more after that. Then you hear about it again, and, you're, and you kind of think like, well, man, I think I've heard something like that before, and you still kind of dismiss it. But then the third time, you know, it's, it's kind of gotten through to you enough to maybe make a decision about it and, and say, you know what, maybe I should just really check this out. You know, I've seen, I've, I've heard about it a couple times. I think I'll go check it out. Or not. I mean, you make that decision. But, um, I mean, that's just the way we work. That's the way we operate. I mean, that's why there's so much money being pumped in by the corporations and all the advertising. Because they want you to see this stuff over and over and over again. Because that's, you know, whatever message they want to give to you, whatever product they're trying to sell to you, they're trying to push that in front of you because they know that people will respond to that. And if that's the way we are, well, so much the more we need to hear the things of the Bible. We need to hear the laws of God. We need to hear these great truths repeated over and over again to us. Uh, Philippians chapter 3. Turn if you would there. That's going to be probably the last place we'll turn. Philippians chapter 3. Maybe Philippians 3 and then one up going to Jude. But um, just a little bit more scriptural evidence for this as well because I'm not just basing everything off of marketing. But um, Philippians chapter 3 verse 1 the Bible reads, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. So, 
he's saying, look, it's not grievous to me. It's not, it doesn't make me sad to write the same things unto you. But for you, it's safe. You need to hear this again. And what does he end up telling them? Beware. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil. Paul gave a lot of admonition to beware of people. Watch out for the false prophets. Watch out for these evil workers of iniquity. Watch out for this. Watch, you know, watch out for these sins. Watch out for all these different things. We need to hear that over and over and over again so we don't come complacent with it. And then jump down to verse number 18 of Philippians 3. Verse number 18 says, For many walk of whom I have told you often. He's like, I've told you about these guys over and over again. And now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Paul's saying, look, I'm weeping over this. I'm crying. Please, just, if you don't do anything else, just listen to me. These men are wicked. They're evil. Don't get caught up in their false ways. Listen to what I have to say. I'm going to tell you again. I've told you often because I care about you and I don't want you getting caught up in this. This is how Bible preaching needs to be. This is, and, and I'll tell you what, because it's not just the preaching needs to be that way. We also have to understand our own attitudes. When we come into church, you know, this is why the preacher is going to be repetitive sometimes. We need to hear these things. So don't come in and start rolling your eyes and saying, oh, you know, Pastor Burson, he's preaching on soul winning again. Here we go. Or he's, he's preaching on adultery again. Here we go. Or he's preaching on, you know, what, whatever. Whatever the subject is, whatever the topic is. Don't have that type of an attitude because that attitude is guaranteed to make sure that you don't actually learn anything. If you just automatically just turn and say, oh, he's preaching about this. I, I already know about that. I don't need to hear this. That type of attitude, you're going you're gonna to just, you, first of all, you won't learn anything. Nobody knows everything about everything. I don't care how many times you've read something, you've heard it preached before. There's always something to be learned from God's Word. I believe that with all of my heart because I've known that to be true so many times. So when you hear something, don't just tune it out because, first of all, you don't know what you might learn. But secondly, having that type of attitude is dangerous because none of us is above falling into sin and backsliding. The Bible says, you know, take, you know let the strong man take heed lest he fall, right? That, that we need to take heed to our own ways unless we fall, unless we get into sin. And when you have an attitude, you start thinking like, oh, yeah, I, already know. I, don't, I don't need to listen to the rest of this sermon because I, I know this stuff. It's a, it's a proud, haughty attitude. And the Bible says that, you know, great destruction comes before, um, or a proud heart cometh before destruction, right? When we start thinking that we know everything, it'll lead us to destruction. And honestly, too, you know, with that type of an attitude, if that's your first instinct is to just dismiss something, maybe there's all the more reason to be thinking about that and, and, and really ex examine yourself. If you're hearing something over and over again, I know for myself, and this isn't always the case, so like, I know we talked about this before with Armor of God sermon, but like, um, you know, when you hear things repeated, especially from different sources, pay special attention to that. Maybe God is trying to, to teach you something that you need to know. And we can't always know for sure that that's the case, but consider it. And think about it. And, and if, uh, you know, if, and I'll tell you why, because oftentimes, like, I don't know what's going on in people's lives in general. I really don't. And most pastors don't really know, and they'll be preaching on things. And, you know, when I prepare my sermons, I prepare my sermons from listening to the Bible, reading the Bible, and whatever God seems to be showing me and kind of, and kind of, you know, it's hard to describe, but just like laying on me where he's kind of opening up my understanding about something and, and, just, and just pointing something out in a way where, where, you know, whether it's just my understanding, I don't know. It, it feels like I'm being led of God to, to say, okay, well, this is what I'm going to preach on this week. I don't know what the reasons are. Don't assume that I just know and be like, oh man, Pastor Burr's just rip on me because he knows I'm not doing this or I'm doing that or, you know, like, I don't. It's probably the case. 
<laughs> I probably have no idea. So if you hear something, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is have the right attitude and, and don't, don't think that I'm just picking on you or something else because odds are I have no idea. And, and if you hear something repeated a few times and it's starting to bother you, definitely take notice of that um, so that you can make, because it, it probably is directed for you. Whether I know it or not, it probably is directed for you so that you can make that change. I mean, God wants us all to get right with Him. Amen. That's what He wants for us. He doesn't want us to continue in sin. He wants us to understand what His Word is. And, I mean, He did it with Moses. He's willing to take the time. This is part of His long suffering. When we don't get it the first time, He said, okay, Moses, go tell these people again. They need to hear this. This is important. I don't want those people to die. You don't want those people to die. So remind them again. Give them this message again. Tell them again. And you know what? The longer you're in church, you might start to, when you start to get a, a, a dull, bad attitude, you can start thinking this way and saying, oh, I'm, well, I've heard this already. Oh, he's preaching about the, the Bible version. Oh, I've heard this already. And instead of having an attitude, go in there thinking like, okay, you know, I, I know this. But I'm going to try to listen and see what else can I learn. A good example with us, my wife and I, we were at, um, we were at a church. And um, we heard, we were there for, it was a Christmas. When we heard, we went to Sunday. So we don't do Sunday school, but a lot of Baptist churches do. Where they have, it's kind of like, a, it's like preaching before the main service. So you go in a little bit early, they call it Sunday school, and they'll typically be going through maybe a book of the Bible or something like that, and they kind of focus on a few verses and expound that and explain that. And it's like a, it's like a small sermon. It, it is. It's a sermon before the main preaching and the singing and, all, and everything else. And so we go, we go to church, and I think it was a Christmas, I think it was like the closest day to Christmas that it was. It was like a Sunday. We go to, to, to Sunday school, and it was a salvation message. And it was on John 3.16. And then we stick around, of course, for church, for the regular service. And it comes time for the sermon. It's a salvation message. It's John 3.16. Okay. So we're thinking like, great. You know, this is, we're saved. Hello. Like we're, we're in church because we want to learn something more. And, and I get that. You know what? Some churches are kind of bad about actually teaching, you know, more content, more meat. And it, everything seems to be a salvation message. But even if that's the case, and you're saying, you know what, and in John 3.16, I mean, you heard that verse quite a bit. But if you have the right attitude, and if you're really listening and saying, you know what, I'm I want to try to gain something new today. I want to try to, to grow a little bit more. And if that's your attitude, you will. Something would probably, I mean, even if it's just as simple as just a refresher of what you already know, even if it's just as simple as giving you just a little bit more of a, of a desire to go out soul winning, you know, whatever it may be, it could be something that you, I've learned things where it wasn't even specifically taught from the sermon, but it came through from God's word. Like, because they'll be preaching on something and, I, and may I'll read like a couple more verses and stuff and then whatever he's saying, it's just like, oh, wow, look at this. And it wasn't, it, it wasn't said by the, by the preacher. But when you're going in with the right attitude and you're listening and you want to learn, God will, God will teach you. But you have to have that mindset. If you just tune everything out, you're guaranteed not to learn. Guaranteed. I mean, you just turn things off, you're not going to learn anything. Then what's the point? What's the point of even coming? Um, and find, you know, one last point on, on the repetition. Turn, if you would, to Jude. That'll be the last place I would turn. Turn to the book of Jude. With preaching in general, when you make changes in your life, like actually getting rid of sin or, or starting to do something you weren't doing before, it generally doesn't happen as the result of just one sermon that you've heard. Now, sometimes one sermon is the tipping point, but typically, you've heard the same thing already multiple times, and then like maybe you hear it again, and you're like, I got to do this. That's usually how it happens. Now, 
Does that mean it never happens where someone hears something the first time and changes? No, I mean, that happens. And, and praise God when that does happen. And that could happen with, especially with like new believers. You know, they get on fire like, like I just want to get what, right with God and they'll hear something, they'll make a change, they'll hear something, they'll make a change. Great, all the better. But that's not how it normally works with most people, honestly. I mean, normally we have to hear something, we have to hear it again, we have to hear it again before we finally actually do something about it. Um, so have the right, if, if you get nothing else from the sermon tonight, get this, that you have the right type of an attitude when you hear the preaching, when it's repetitive, when you think you've heard it before, when, when it's just like, I don't want to hear this tonight. I, just, well, I wanted to hear something else. We read this chapter as the opening chapter, and I was thinking you're going to preach on this other thing because I really want to hear about that. And now you're preaching about this topic, which I've already heard before, and I've heard other preachers say, and you know, what can I possibly learn? Don't have that attitude. Don't have that attitude. Um, it's, it's only going to not help you at all. It's going to hurt you. It's, 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 you won't learn anything. And there's no point. We're in Jude. Look at verse number three of the book of Jude. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And I think this is very fitting for me in the story I gave about like John 3.16 and you hear the salvation message and everything else. Jude's writing here, he says, you know, I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation. I was diligent about it. I made sure that I write unto you about this. He says, why? Because there are false prophets out there. There are people that creep in unawares and they're trying to taint that doctrine. They're trying to taint salvation. They're trying to pervert it. They're trying to change it. And you, even something as simple as salvation, say, well, I'm already saved. I know that. And I preach the gospel. Hey, we got to make sure that we don't get veer, veer off and start steering into the direction of, of, of lies and of a false gospel because somebody is, you know, some false teacher out there is, is starting to, to change your mind and starting to, to get your attention and starting to, to change what you believe a little bit because you haven't heard the basic truth again and again and again. And, and, you know, this is what he's doing. He's saying, you know, there's, there's these people, they're crept in, they're unawares, you don't even realize it, and they're trying to just pervert the gospel a little bit, and they're trying to get you off on the wrong path. So it was needful for me, I gave all diligence to, to preach unto you the common salvation. Again, he says, you already knew this. You know, when God saved you out of the land of Egypt, he destroyed those that believed not. And, and we need to hear this again. And... Um, <clears throat> So, repetition is important for us. We see God doing it. We see examples in the Bible. I mean, think about there's, there's four Gospels, right? There's some repetition. We saw Deuteronomy is, is kind of a repetition of the law. Um, the book of Psalms, songs in themselves are kind of inherently have a lot of repetition. Um, I think of that Psalm, I have in my notes, well, uh, I did an entire sermon on it, but um, Psalm 136, where it, like at the end of every verse, it says, for his mercy endureth forever, for his mercy endureth forever. Hey, that's good teaching. You know, I realize it's part of a song. And there's a lot of repetition songs, but what are songs doing? They're teaching us. Teaching yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's what they do. And there's a lot of repetition to that. His mercy endureth forever. His mercy. Hey, God's mercy endures forever. That is amazing salvation doctrine in and of itself. His mercy endures forever. Your sins are covered forever. He extends that mercy unto you forever. Great, great messages. And they're repeated over and over and over. And, and that's why when we preach sermons, when I preach sermons on topics, on sins or whatever, we turn to so many different places in the Bible. Why? Because the Bible talks about those things over and over and over again. And the more important something is within God's Word, the more attention He gives it, that's what I'm going to try to do as well. The things that, that will be worthy of death, hey, I'm going to focus on those things a, a little bit more. 
because it's more serious than some of the other things. Now, am I going to focus on the other things too? Yes, but not quite as much attention is devoted to them as the most serious things. This is why we need repetition. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for giving us the repetition that we need in your word, dear God. Help us to, to never come to the point where we have this attitude, where we go into church just thinking that we know everything, that we know it all, that we don't need to hear this again. Because usually when we, when we have that type of an attitude, God, that's exactly what we need to hear. We need to humble ourselves. We need to realize that we don't know everything, dear Lord. And when a certain topic is being preached, we need to pay all the more attention to what that subject is and really take a good look inside of ourselves to say, hey, Am I doing enough soul winning? Am I kind of slipping towards the sin? Am I looking at the, at the wrong things or, or at people that I shouldn't be looking at? Am, am, I, am I starting to get these wrong thoughts in my head? Am I starting to make justifications for sin, dear Lord? And, and now I'm starting to hear him preach about it. Lord, help us not to push that away, but to embrace it, to embrace the truth and the love that you have for us that, that we might be able to hear these great truths from your word. Lord, help us never to become dull of hearing, but that we would ever be just, just hanging on your very words and the words of life that you have for us. And um, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.